Hello there, Richard Westwood here from St Anne's Church in Chasetown with a midweek message for Wednesday the 4th of September. I've been fortunate to have three months of extended study leave over the summer and I'm really glad to be back with everyone at St Anne's and in the parish of Chasetown uh, now that uh, term is restarting and uh, lots of activities are re-going again as we enter autumn. And our midweek messages uh, for the coming months are going to be a dip into the Old Testament in part. There'll be some other bits and pieces which apply around harvest time. But uh, for the first few, we're going to be looking at some of the passages in the, the book of Genesis from the Bible, uh, which tell us about one of the characters uh, in those chapters who's a bit of an unlikely person, really. Uh, that's the person of Jacob. Uh, and Jacob, who later becomes the father of Joseph. If you're familiar, familiar with Joseph and the, the amazing Technicolor dream coat, well, Jacob is Joseph's dad. Uh, and um, uh, what I thought we might do in the coming weeks is just have a little look at how God interacts with and involves Jacob in all of the purposes that God has uh, for his people. Um, Jacob, um, I'm, so I guess I'm starting out in, in, in and around Genesis chapter 25 which is where we first come across uh, uh, Jacob. Uh, he is um, one of the children. Uh, he has a brother called Esau. Uh, and Jacob and Esau are, uh, are twins who are born very close to each other in terms of time. Esau is born first and Jacob closely followed him along uh, and uh, he is the second born. It's significant because in the, in the period of time that we're speaking of, the firstborn son has particular rights uh, in the sort of nomadic tribes that we're speaking of at this point period of time in the ancient Near East. So Esau being the firstborn to Isaac and Rebekah, uh, forgive me, Isaac and Rachel, um, and um, Esau is the one who, in theory, would be the one who would be the firstborn son and have the principal inheritance rights. That isn't how it works out though. Esau, uh, when he's born, he's, he's covered in hair apparently, so they call him the name Esau, which means hairy. And then hard on his heels, literally on his heels, becomes, comes out Jacob uh, from the womb. And Jacob is called that because he, he was, at, according to the story, he was grasping the heel of Esau as Esau was born. And so the phrase Jacob means he grasps the heel. But I'm told it's an, a sort of Hebrew's description or Hebrew idiom for saying he deceives. So I don't know whether giving someone a name which means he deceives ends up colouring the sort of way that they might develop their character. But Jacob, as we will see, ends up being a bit of a schemer, to be honest. He's a slippery character, a schemer, a bit of a Del Boy sort of person. Um, and people don't really trust him, perhaps with good reason. Surely he's not supposed to be an example to us, is he, of how God's people are supposed to believe. Well, the remarkable thing is that, despite it all, God seems to find a way of using and blessing Jacob and finding a way to involve him in his purposes. And I'm going to read a section now, a bit for a few, few chapters further on, from Genesis 25 where we first meet Jacob and I'm reading now Genesis chapter 28. What's happened so far is that Jacob's dad Isaac has told Jacob to go to a particular part of the land and to look for a wife to find for himself. Uh, Esau has heard that and Esau uh, having been cheated out of his birthright by Jacob decides to go in the opposite direction and doesn't choose uh, the kind of wife that his father Isaac is wanting him to. So Jacob sets off, hopefully to try and find um, uh, a wife, and he goes to a place called Bethel. And here's where we join the story, which is Genesis chapter 28, beginning at verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba, where they were based, and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. 
He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and the east, to the north and the south. All peoples will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awake from his, awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on it. He called the place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And, all that, of, all, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So that's the story that you may have come across before about Jacob having a dream in which he sees a, a ladder which becomes a stairway to heaven. And uh, the features around that I think are really fascinating. There's so much in the passage that we could take a long time to discover. And I guess as the unfolding story of Jacob comes to us in the coming weeks, we might see that Jacob has a mixture of parts to his character. Sometimes he gets it right. Sometimes he gets it wrong. He's a schemer, as I've mentioned. He often gets, makes wrong decisions. He often backs away from responsibility, makes poor and self-indulgent decisions. But sometimes he's courageous and sometimes he honours God. I guess the point I'm I'd want us to draw out from this and, and the whole of the Jacob story as it unfolds in the pages across the, the, the chapters of Genesis is that it, Jacob isn't the main point, I guess. The point is not that really whether Jacob is someone we should try and copy as though just because it's in the Bible it's an, a narrative or a story which says, yes, do it this way. No, I think the point is that Jacob despite his failings, finds that God is faithful. These stories are not there for us to copy the characters in the Bible, some of whom uh, the individuals reported, like us, are broken and screw things up. Rather, they are there to reassure us that despite our failings, God is faithful and God persists persists with us to work out his good purposes. And of course, if we go God's way, this is exactly what God would want. But there is encouragement for all of us to know that even when we mess up, God does not let it end there. The story of Jacob, who we'll see is a schemer, is that God wants us to know that God will not let our faults and failings be the end of the story. Rather, they are the starting point for God to say, let's get back on track and go again. Go again with God, the God who loves us. And like this story, this little snippet that I've read from Genesis chapter 28, God promises not just to bless us, but to be the person who will bless others through us, that we might be a blessing to them. So perhaps there are parts of our lives that have gone up and down, maybe years ago, maybe even in the present. Let's remember that God doesn't let it end there. The lesson of Jacob is that our failings are not the end of the story when it comes to God. God will not let us go 
and God continues to work out God's purposes, even when our decisions might take us in a strange direction. God wants to bring us back and reroute us in a direction which is going to honour God and bring about God's purposes again. I hope that the start of September is a good one for you and I look forward to being able to share with you, along with others, uh, some of the other stories about Jacob and his family as they unfold in the coming weeks. A prayer. Living Lord, we thank you that you never let go of us and that even when things go wrong or when we make bad decisions, even when things seem a bit chaotic, you are still seeking to work out your purposes, which are good. So please help us to draw encouragement from Jacob's story that despite our failings, you are at work. Despite the struggles, you are at work. And we pray, Lord, that you would use us to be a blessing to the people around us, our family, our friends, even people we disagree with, even people we haven't yet met. May we, Lord, be a blessing to those you bring across our path. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening. See you soon. Bye-bye.